So what I was going to do, and I, when I originally looked through the uh, through the, the the program, what I'm going to do is touch on two things. One is uh, how to identify a cervical deformity, and then how to avoid causing cervical deformity in uh, in a number of cases. And what happens, at least when I was a resident, when we talked about cervical deformity, we would do a Cobb measurement from the inferior aspect of C2 through to the uh, bottom of C7 or T1. And we would measure the amount of lordosis that was present. And what we're recognizing, and I think you're going to hear later from Dr. Peter Passius about the number of different measurements that are done, but that is only very one very small component of what we're looking at when we talk about cervical deformity. And a lot of things involve gravity lines and different things that we've gradually learned in the thoracic and lumbar spine and that Bob, you know, Jens Chapman and others in Seattle have been so instrumental in introducing into the uh, medical literature. And so what's happening is that this was an interesting uh, study that was done looking at what is considered normal alignment. So this was 230 asymptomatic individuals. And what they found was that basically somewhere around 60% of people had sort of a, what was previously considered normal cervical alignment when you go and you do a measurement from C2 to C7. And they found that 19% of people had an actual kyphosis and still remained asymptomatic. There were people who had alternating areas of kyphosis and lordosis, which they called sigmoid kyphosis, which occurred in about almost 10% of people. And there were a number of people who had straight spines. So that overall, only you know, about two thirds of patients have what's considered a normal alignment if we do an alignment between uh, C2 or C3 and C7. So what happened is because we knew that there were people that were significantly symptomatic related to their cervical alignment, it was gradually recognized that there were other factors in the thoracic spine and in the upper cervical spine and in, in sort of gravity lines that were more likely to be associated with symptoms. And if we go back 30 years ago, uh, when we looked at people with thoracolumbar deformity, you know, it was really almost universally thought that the Cobb angle measurement, if you had a curve of 30 degrees compared to a curve of 50 degrees, a 50 degree curve was going to be far more symptomatic than a 30 degree curve, but that wasn't necessarily the case. And these things of sagittal alignment became increasingly important, which is coming to recognition in the cervical spine. So this work really was, it was led by Chris Ames, showed that a gravity line, a plumb line from, uh, from C2, and how, how uh, anterior that was to compared to C7 was the uh, principal driver of symptoms. And even if you compared it to the work of Steve Glassman looking at thoracic lumbar deformity, this correlation with the neck disability index scores was far, far greater. So if you go and you get your gravity line out of alignment, the chances of you becoming symptomatic are far higher. So this compares Steve Glassman's work to Chris Ames' work and shows that, uh, that, that this malalignment is really a strong driver uh, of symptoms. And this shows looking at uh, in the EQ5D measurements, comparing other disease states, that if you have a cervical deformity measured by that C2 to C7 SVA, that it really has a major impact in your life. It has more impact than having a stroke or renal failure or emphysema. Um, and, uh, and as I said, it is a significant driver of, of, of symptoms. So what's happening, there's been some different work looking at the interplay between you know, different alignment measures. And because the cervical spine is so flexible, a lot of times the cervical spine can serve as a compensatory mechanism that actually reflects uh, disease in other areas 
as the uh, as the uh, principal driver. And one of the principal drivers is the amount of thoracic kyphosis. And as you're going to see in a second, that the alignment of T2, something called the probably T1, the T1 slope is a major driver for what happens in the cervical spine. So what happens is if you have little thoracic kyphosis and you have a small T1 slope for whatever reason, you generally only need a small amount of cervical lordosis. Whereas if you have a bigger thoracic kyphosis, you have a larger T1 slope and it's associated with a, a large lumbar lordosis. And there's a number of different measurements that go in there. And Dr. Passius, as I mentioned, will give you the most up-to-date ones. But this just goes to show you, and this is very analogous to the pelvic incidence. And, and some people call this the cervical incidence. So what happens is, is if you have uh, an inflexible cervical spine or a lot of cervical degeneration, you can see how the head movement actually changes in position because you, you can't compensate. And then this leads to that big C2, C7, SBA change, which is associated with, with, with symptoms. And one of the problems is your head is about four and a half kilograms. And if this is out of alignment, okay, your head is, is, is projected anteriorly, it takes a tremendous amount of muscular energy. And again, this is one of Chris Ames' patients to be able to go and help hold the head up and this and people develop rapid fatigue, neck pain and other problems, okay? So another thing that happens is if you have these kind of problems, the, the, the area which is most likely to compensate is at the junction between C1 and C2 where you end up hyperextending in that area and this ends up driving, this ends up driving, uh, driving symptoms. So this is just a case uh, of mine from some years ago where a lady came in who'd had multiple thoracic surgeries, but what she complained about is horrific, un intractable neck pain. And you know, just the neck was killing her, killing her, killing her. And when I looked at her, her, her imaging, what I see here, you can see this C2, C7, SVA change and, and suddenly you had a reason why her neck was so painful. If you also look at the neck itself, as she's really having to hyperextend and her C1, C2 angle, which was really high, and she had a very low C1 tilt, meaning that again, she was, she was, she was, she was, uh, she was hyperextending through that area. And this was a compensatory mechanism. I'm gonna show you this a bit. So even though she came in and she said, oh my goodness, my neck is absolutely killing me. I said, I'm gonna propose an operation in your thoracic and lumbar spine. And she goes, you know, she thought that I was crazy. She goes, it's my neck, my neck is killing me. And I said, look, I can fuse you to the occiput with your neck, but you're still going to have neck pain because your neck is com compensating for what the rest of your spine is doing. So as you can see here, you can see here that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that when I did this operation, it involved you know, enhancing her lumbar lordosis with some hyperlordotic cages. It involved an upper thoracic uh, VCR operation to correct, uh, correct uh, uh, her, uh, her T1 slope. And as you can see, everything uh, uh, relaxed. I took a few slides out because Linda didn't want me to run, run, run over. So when we're looking at these x-rays, the neck x-rays, the thoracic lumbar x-rays, you know, the question is, where is the problem coming from? Okay, and I'm gonna give you a little, uh, little, little quickie answer to, to do it. You can see this is another patient where there's been a number of different measurements done. And this person is in, uh, is in severe C2 to C7 SVA malalignment. The overall thoracic lumbar SVA is significantly malaligned, and so where does this, where does this, uh, where do these uh, abnormalities come from? And this is doing some different, you know, kind of surgical planning software to see if I corrected certain things. Where is the correction? What is that going to result in? And this is very similar to 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 to, to the last case. So what's happening is when I look at a, a, a neck, 
to see what I'm doing. There are several measurements that I do. And one of them is whether it is to do an evaluation of the C2 tilt, okay? And if the C2, if the C2 tilt is low and the T1 slope is high, then I know that this deformity is a thracolumbar deformity and that's where the correction needs to occur, okay? And what you can see here is this person developed severe PJK above a previous fusion. That PJK resulted in a high T1 slope and the neck is compensating for that. So I know that this is a thracolumbar deformity. In this case, uh, when we look here, this person has a normal T1 slope and has a very high C2 tilt. And this means that basically that this is a cervical deformity and needs to be corrected through an operation in the cervical spine. In this case, both the C2 tilt and the T1 slope are both high, and that shows that it's a combined deformity, okay, that both areas are abnormal. And this is, again, this is another one of my patients here where this is also true, okay, that you can see uh, the high uh, the, uh, the high measures in both areas. And again, you can see the reason why this person, one of the problems that they had was cervical degeneration. They also suffered a fracture in the upper thoracic spine, which increased the T1 slope. And this was the, uh, this was the operation that I did, uh, including an upper thoracic VCR, but also corrected the cervical spine because both areas were contributing to the overall deformity. So how do we, there's, so, the, so what happens is that when we look at cervical deformity, kyphosis is the most common deformity. It, is, it, it happens, but it's fairly rare to get a cervical scoliosis. Usually if you have that, that's a congenital condition or something where somebody did something woefully wrong during a surgery. And what happens, the most common cause of kyphosis is iatrogenic. So what's happening is how can you get a cervical deformity? You can remove the posterior tethers. You can compromise the facet joints. You can denervate the muscle. You can neglect the preoperative kyphosis. You can have other things like radiation damage. You can have problems like Parkinson's disease, which is a very, very difficult problem to treat. And you can have a rheumatologic conditions. Now, I removed by mistake when I was trying to go and do my slides. So in the lumbar spine, in the thoracic spine, about 80% of the gravity is, is borne by the anterior column. In the neck, it is about 70% about is borne by the posterior column through the facet joints and through the posterior elements. And that is why if you compromise those, you are far more likely to develop a deformity. And you're gonna see here that this person has got a, de a deformity due to the muscular uh, denervation that had occurred related to this upper cervical surgery that had been, had been performed. And one of the biggest concepts to remember is the muscle, the semispinalis cervicus muscle, is about 40% of the total neck extension. And it originates from the uh, posterior elements of T1 through T4, and it inserts on the inferior aspect of the spinous process of C2. And if you remove these attachments, either, either lower down, you're at big risk of developing DJK below a, a, a cervical fusion. And if you remove the upper attachments, you are at risk of developing uh, kyphosis. And this is uh, an example of a, a child that I saw, this was a two-year-old who'd had a surgery by one of my pediatric partners about six months before this for a neurofibroma and basically did a, a C2 laminectomy. And you can see that within, within six months developed this horrific deformity because of the muscular imbalance in a young child. The ch children are far more susceptible to this, this problem. And you can see with the neurofibromatosis, there weren't much, much in the way of posterior elements available for me to work with and I end up doing this. And uh, the child was put, been previously placed in a halo 
which I maintained and this fused up nicely and I was able to take care of the problem. So again, reiterating the importance of the semispinalis cervicus and its attachments and, and, and techniques to spare that become important. And that's why a lot of people will do a C3 laminotomy uh, with a laminoplasty just to make sure that they don't damage this muscle. And again, here are some additional cases uh, of the, the consequences of semispinalis cervicus uh, removal. So it's important to be thoughtful about removing lamina and ligaments. Consider laminoplasty when you can. Be careful about removing more than the 50% of the facet joints. And again, uh, just showing uh, another example of somebody who you, you, that this is a real concerning patient. And the reason why is you can see that there is significant atrophy of the, of the, of the posterior paraspinal muscles. And what happens is that we realize that people like this, neuromuscular conditions, malnutrition, other problems are at real risk. And looking at things like the MRI scan to see fatty degeneration or loss of muscles become real important and, and, and trying to improve frailty before surgery is important. These are some of the things that we're doing routinely in all of our uh, adult deformity patients to be able to assess whether we can improve frailty prior to uh, surgery. And again, what happens is once these processes start, it's a self-perpetuating situation due to the way that the gravity lines work in the, adult, in the adult spine. And as you start to develop this kyphosis, you're at increased risk of developing symptoms like myelopathy. So to wrap up my, se to wrap up my session, you know, one of the things which Chris Ames really has done a real service uh, and again, another uh, ISSG member along with Bob is trying to go and codify how you assess cervical deformity. And what he did is he looked at the cervical uh, sagittal SVA, the C2 through C7. He looked at the horizontal gauge, and this is again looking, including patients who have conditions such as ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, looking at the lordosis minus the PI, be able to go, shows the abilities the body's ability to compensate for what the T1 slope is, and then the location is, is taken into consideration. So what's happening is, I mentioned to you that the, 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 the weight-bearing axis is generally in the cervical spine through the posterior elements that makes these conditions done. And these are some of the descriptors where it's located uh, in uh, this ISSG uh, classification as far as those, those areas are concerned. And so by doing this, this overall global assessment, looking at the T1 slope, looking at the, uh, the C2 tilt, it tells you where the deformities are and where to be able to go and to be able to do the correction that needs to be, to be done. So I think Vince Trinellis is going to be speaking about the, about the uh, different osteotomies. So I removed all the, all the discussions uh, in that area. Uh, uh, as far as things are concerned. So in conclusion, uh, the cervical and cervical thoracic deformity can prevent the, uh, a, a big spectrum, both clinically and radiographic. And just because someone's complaining of neck pain, you really need to look at the entire spine to see what the contribution it is to the neck. Prevention of deformity saves future problems. You know, a thorough assessment, including I say for almost everybody, uh, uh, both uh, cervical radiographs, and long cassette x-rays or total spine x-rays really help you to assess that better. And then how to go fix that, you're gonna hear about in, in future talks. So basically that's, uh, that's my, uh, my overview as far as, uh, as far as this is concerned. Hopefully I've stayed uh, close to on time. And, uh, and I, I saw that there were some things in the chat. Let me just see who are we, to see if there's anybody that, uh, that uh, had anything that I need to answer. And I, it looks like it's no. So thank you, Bob. Thank you, the entire uh, Seattle Science Foundation team. I think I see Jens sitting there, my old friend Jens in the front row. Hi, Jens, great to see you. And, uh, and, and I congratulate all you hearty souls that were able to, you know, to, to, to make your way to Seattle to, learn, to get a great education. <laughs>